guess we'll get started uh, a little bit. So, uh, you know, we uh, in initially intended this session to kind of be a open kind of Q&A session with folks who had questions on how the CNCF technical process works, the, you know, how the technical board is representative, and, you know, if you're interested in bringing projects, you basically have the two right people to, to talk here. But uh, my name is Chris Anizic. I have the fun job of helping uh, run CNCF, uh, mostly on the uh, technical side of the house. Uh, Quinton is... Yes. Oh, uh, you're hooked up? All right. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm on the TOC, on the Technical Oversight Committee. Yeah. Uh, so I work closely with Chris and his team, uh, and we basically take care of most of the technical aspects of the yeah. project yeah. Uh, and the technical vision for the, for the foundation yeah. and for the CNCF in general. Um, I have a few yep. slides, so one format we could, we, we're going to use is just go through yep. some of the basic content and then we'll open it up for a discussion. Yeah, I think we'll just go like, you know, five minutes to the slides and then just open it up and see if any have questions and uh, go from there. Let's do cool. it. Excellent. So, um, you know, what, is, what exactly is the TOC, the Technical Oversight Com uh, Committee? Uh, what is its reason for existence? Um, the short answer is that it, it maintains the technical vision for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So this includes, you know, all the projects that we in uh, incorporate into the CNCF, deciding which projects those are, setting the bars for entrance, um, doing technical uh, evaluations of these projects and setting out the overall uh, kind of architecture of the various projects that we have and how they all fit together. Um, do you want to yeah, I, mean, I think the important thing here to point out is, uh, you know, CNCF has kind of different constituencies. We have like a board of directors that's mostly con uh, consisted of members. Um, uh, we created a technical board that is completely separate from the uh, business board, uh, there for independence. So like you can't, you can't like buy your way into a CNCF project. There's an independent technical board that uh, Quinton is part of that helps with the due diligence. So uh, it was done on purpose, essentially for, it's a good governance uh, uh, practice in my opinion. Yeah, and, and some of the motivation behind that is, you know, we, we believe pretty strongly that um, cloud native computing and increasing the adoption of it in general uh, is good for the world and good for the CNCF and good for all the sponsors and members of the CNCF. And so in some cases we, we can, it's possible to get into conflicts where there are business interests that, you know, encourage a, a particular company to, for example, have a particular project with a given architecture or whatever, which we don't think is going to actually raise the tide for everybody. Um, and it's our job to make sure that the tide ra raises for everybody and, and doesn't drop for some and raise for others. Um, so that's sort of the background to it. Um, yeah? Yeah, I think that's good. Let's try. Oh, uh, yeah. It's <laughs> the crazy governance structure. I don't know if this is really relevant, but basically, uh, kind of like, you know, U.S. Supreme Court, you know, there, there's nine uh, folks. Uh, it's an odd number of folks that... Uh, decide which projects get in the CNCF. Um, the simple solution is we have different projects level. Uh, early stage kind of project, projects only need two TOC members to sponsor them uh, to move to the higher levels, which are kind of the more uh, formal statement that these are high quality projects meant to be used by pretty much everyone, require two thirds supermajority votes uh, from the TOC. So um, it's a little bit convoluted of how we structured the uh, TOC, but I, I'm not going to dive into those details. I don't think it's uh, really technically relevant for, for the crowd here. So Yeah, cool. I agree with you. <laughs> some people elect some of the people, and some other people elect other of the people, and the end result is we have <laughs> yeah. nine hopefully yeah. good TOC yeah. members. Um, maybe worth briefly mentioning is, you know, what does a good TOC member look like? Uh, we have some qualification criteria. So basically these are people typically with a fairly long track record in, in cloud computing in general. So, you know, not unusually, they come from companies that have been doing this for 10 plus years. I personally came out of Amazon where I did, did it for quite a few years and Google and now Huawei. Uh, and many of the other contributors come from, or TOC members come from similar long histories with containers, you know, microservices, big cloud computing, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the other thing we look for, not only in the, in the companies that provide these individuals because they're all you know members who provide these individuals to serve on the TOC um, but the individuals themselves need to be able to you know it's not a purely technical role in the sense that there's sometimes resolution of conflicts that needs to happen there's you know reason debate mm -hmm. uh, and it's important that the people have those you know skills 
And so, like we mentioned before, there's uh, nine members, and uh, you know they're really from all. Like you know, when CNCF was formed three years ago, it was kind of a uh, it's different than it was today, but you can kind of see the different representations here where um, Alexis, who's the chair of the TUC, comes from a startup uh, in the cloud native ecosystem called Weaveworks. Uh, ben is from the uh, Mesosphere, Mesos fame, uh, one of the original creators there who I used to uh, oddly work with at Twitter. Uh, Brian Grant, um, who uh, is of Kubernetes fame from Google. Uh, Brian Cantrell of Joint, uh, Joint fame. Uh, Camille, um, who is, uh, if you know, Zookeeper, she's was very instrumental in that. Uh, Jonathan Bull did a lot of uh, core container work at CoreOS. Uh, Ken Owens uh, is at uh, MasterCard these days, but heavily involved in the Kubernetes community in all sorts of areas like uh, uh, Federation and so on. Uh, there's Quinton here on stage with us. And then uh, Sam Lambert from GitHub, who represents the end user uh, community. So these are kind of the nine folks that have the uh, great responsibility of ensuring that our projects are you know, high quality and we have a consistent technical vision throughout uh, CNCF. So it's kind of like the Supreme Court in some ways. Um, yeah, so uh, Quinton touched on this. Uh, you know, the most, the most important thing to realize uh, in CNCF is there's different project levels out there. Um, we have three stages. Uh, you know, graduated is essentially the highest quality stage. So only Prometheus and Kubernetes uh, fit this bar. Uh, Envoy uh, will fit that bar soon. So we'll have three projects that are essentially uh, are meant for you know, wide adoption, you could bet your business on it essentially and have the blessing of the TOC as a strong kind of technical independent community that you could bet your business on. Incubation. Oh, Sorry, to, to, yeah, just one thing to add there. So, so it's not only the graduated phase is not only about the actual technical quality of the project, yeah. but also making sure that you can bet your business on it for a long time. So, you know, that that's not necessarily possible if it's a single company that is, you know, doing the majority of the development because they may you know, change direction, whatever. So it's very important that we have multiple companies all yeah. contributing actively. So, you know, the, the, the risk of this thing not being Done, there in yeah. five or 10 years is is reduced to close to zero by the time it gets to graduated. Yeah, that's, that, that was definitely- Kubernetes is one of them. <laughs> a, yeah, a very important point. Uh, incubation's kind of where we have our most projects. These are kind of projects that have fulfilled uh, a lot of the minimum kind of requirements of what we require open source projects to have, a clear governance structure, uh, you know, healthy release cycle, and, and so on. Uh, sandbox, you kind of think of as a very early stage uh, area where um, the TOC may want to uh, provide just a, a neutral area for uh, a project where companies can collaborate, or maybe it's a new interesting uh, area like if you remember service meshes were kind of a new concept and you know we brought in Linkerd into the organization as the TOC kind of wanted to do it as a uh, we think service meshes are important so let's take a little bit of a bet on this and, and, and see what happens so it's really early stage um, we don't expect all sandbox projects to succeed you know you could almost think of it as a, as a uh, I don't want to use like the VC analogy but you know if you're like a venture capitalist you bet on and some companies right some are going to do well some don't so kind of think of sandbox at that level where we potentially expect things to fail but we'll try to provide minimal support so they're a good kind of open source neutrally owned open source project yeah, I don't know if you have any other thoughts it's the R and D lab of the CNC yeah, yeah. Ex exactly so some people like the VC analogy some don't so <laughs> um, yeah so this is kind of where we are um, CNCF, I mean, things have changed a lot. Uh, we're about to hit our three-year anniversary, so it's kind of a little sentimental for me. But um, uh, so uh, you know, we have three uh, you know incubating projects in December 2016, and we've grown to a ton right now. Two graduated projects, like I mentioned before, uh, in seven. What's Envoy, up? Envoy got added Envoy today. Will be soon. No, it did not get oh, added did today. Not, oh, uh, oh. It's going to be November 28th. November okay. 28th uh, after U.S. Thanksgiving. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, and wipe that from your mind. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah not exactly. it's not. It's not public yet. Uh, 17 incubating. Uh, projects with uh, Harbor being announced uh, today from BMR China. So um, yeah, we've definitely grown uh, quite a bit uh, in, in, in the two years. And then these are kind of our early stage projects, um, you know, uh, that we have Dragonfly from Alibaba will be on, on this uh, starting tomorrow. But um, it's a, like if you look at it, it's a mix of projects in very interesting spaces uh, and of all different sizes. We have cloud events, which is from serverless. We have specifications around the identity management with Spire and Spiffy. Um, telepresence, which is kind of a developer-focused tool, uh, data stores, TIKB. So it's kind of interesting mix um, of, of, of projects. So I think that's it. Uh, yeah, I've there's got other more. stuff. There's backlog. Let's not really talk about. So this so, is not, you know, super interesting slide. Not the prettiest, but the intention here is there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline here. Um, you know, both on the way into uh, uh, 
sandbox yeah. and also on the way through the graduation process to incubation. Yeah. Uh, so there's a very healthy inflow and we imagine that the number of projects in the CNCF do grow you know, pretty dramatically in the next 12 months. Yeah, so if you have questions in particular of how the process works, um, you have two folks here that could help answer um, them. Uh, we try to operate like an open source project, like the TOC has its own GitHub repo. Um, it's how we expect the community basically to interact with us the most through project proposals. Uh, we do meetings uh, twice a month that are open to uh, the public, but um, you know, now is a good time to answer you know, or ask any questions for us and have them answer, uh, answer them for you. So. So that's basically it. Yes, we have two, okay. For, uh, you're first and then uh, the, the lady. Give a, yeah. Let's give him a mic. Oh, sure, why not, let's do it. Yeah. Thanks, um, I had a two specific, technical specific question for you guys. So one is the languages. You know, Cloud Native is more toward the asynchronous, you know, collaboration within small piece of software. And it is quite different from the past language that she or something. So that language like ballerina is going to be the, my, my personal inter interest. So that, do you have any plan to host those languages itself to write down cloud native application more natively or more asynchronously? And one, the other thing is uh, uh, chaos engineering. So yeah, start okay. with language. Do you want me to talk about languages? Uh, or? Uh, sure, I have my own. OK, of, yeah, no, go, go for you go, it. Uh, you want to go first? So, uh, so like, uh, like YAML was never intended to kind of be the way most you know engineers and developers interact with Kubernetes, but that's kind of how it is now. Um, there is a very wide ecosystem of uh, things. That, I mean, there's Ballerina, uh, MetaParticle. Um, there's a bunch of uh, higher level developer tools that try to hide the YAML as much as possible. Microsoft has Draft. Um, there's a bunch. So I, I think you're going to see a lot of innovation in the space in the next. Um, six to 18 months in CNCF and outside. Um, whether the TOC has an appetite to accept any of these projects in the future, I don't know, that's, that's up to them. But I, I, you're gonna see a lot of activity. And I think, I think it's healthy, like, you know, treat YAML as kind of the assembly language of, of cloud native and then build the tools um, on top. So I don't know, I'm, I'm sure you have thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can put a bit of my own personal spin on it. And, and that is that, you know, there are many different languages out there for Good reason like many of them are very good at certain things and less good at other things uh, and many of them have uh, you know some of them are expedient they're easy to understand people can get started but they maybe have performance issues down the road or whatever um, my personal belief is that there's actually a space for quite a few languages uh, I mean just to quote a few there's a lot of rust projects coming in it's got a lot of strengths it's pretty new Quite difficult to find people who are good Rust programmers. So, you know, there's the pro and con. On the other end of the spectrum, millions and millions of good Java programmers out there. It's also got its challenges, not all of them technical. Um, and I don't think, if you, if you think of the CNCF in a sort of a, a, a multi-decade sort of lifespan, I don't think it's sensible for us to say you have to write your stuff and go and you have to use YAML or you can't use whatever. Um, I think what we need to do is enable as many languages as make sense to be used, you know, the, the right tool for the job philosophy. Use the right tool for the job and link it all together with, you know, microservices and things. That that I think is the is the right way forward. I don't know if that addresses your question. But. <laughs> yes, and, and then uh, there's the chaos engineering question. So chaos engineering, in, in my personal belief, um, you need to, in order to build, you know, cloud native systems, you have to test resiliency, right? And you know, chaos engineering is kind of a modern practice of doing that. Um, a lot of these companies, you know that you know, kind of work cloud native because we're, we're popular had ways to test if systems you know, worked. So in CNCF, we're um, exploring uh, booting up a chaos engineering focused working group that's kind of in the bootstrapping phase. It's not officially blessed yet, but we're basically gathering interested parties, learning about different technologies out there. There's really not many open source chaos engineering projects out there, in my opinion, that are focused on um, uh, let's say Kubernetes uh, in, in, in particular, but see, th there'll be a lot of innovation in this space. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if next year if you see a chaos engineering uh, working group proposed um, in, in CNCF. So, does that answer your questions? I had a, maybe one, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. one further response. observation on that, yeah. which is, um, you know, I come from a like, very, very big system background. So, you know, the Google things had, that I ran had literally millions of, you know, machines. Um, and so when chaos engineering came around in that context, I was like, 
but our machines randomly fail all the time anyway. So, you know, we have at least 10 machines fail every minute. So I don't need a chaos monkey to make that happen. But it, but it is true that, you know, if you have much smaller infrastructure, you have 10 machines, uh, you know, they're probably not going to fail every day. And if you don't know what happens when they do, you have to have, you know, some way of doing that. You can either run around pushing buttons and stuff like that, or you can deploy a chaos monkey. So I think it has its place. Uh, I think pretty quickly you get to a scale where you don't get as much value out of that uh, because stuff crashes and breaks anyway. <laughs> cool, that's a question. Hi, um, my question, I have two questions as well actually. The first one is what triggers a project going from sandbox to um, incubating to graduation? Like how do you guys run that process? The second part is how do you treat conflicting projects like Linkerd and Envoy or how do you guys think about that? Um, didn't, didn't we decide that we weren't going to allow difficult questions? Uh, <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. So the, the second question I think is easier to answer. So second question, uh, we always allow for competing projects. Um, it's completely okay within the scope of the foundation. We actually think it's healthy. Um, let the market decide winners at the end of the day. The foundation's role is not to be a king-making organization. We don't want to favor one project over the other. We'll support them both. And then the market will decide at the end of the day. And if uh, there's a dominant project at the end of the day, we may choose to archive the one that doesn't work out at the end of the day. But um, the goal is like we allow for competing projects. We actually think it's healthy, in, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. And the, uh, for, uh, the first question was around how do we decide between a project moving from sandbox, incubating, and graduation. Um, there's uh, two ways to look at, look at this. One, there is actually concrete um, criteria that we have online published in the GitHub re repository. And a lot of it is around, you know, um, if it's just from like one organization, right, that's probably an earlier sandbox thing. If you have multiple maintainers from different uh, companies, good. Do you have like a code of conduct, security disclosure process? There's all these kind of criteria that help kind of uh, divide, uh, you know, where you'll be. And then there's also this subjective requirement or subjective view where the TOC themselves has a judgment call based on their experience in the industry where they think things um, kind, of, kind of fit. Uh, the sandbox is a much lower barrier to get in and we kind of, because we want to encourage experimentation, but the other levels are much more difficult to get to and require the uh, su you know, subjectivity of these industry you know, experts who have been around for, yeah. for a while. Yeah, maybe I can add, I mean, th there's quite a lot of stuff and it's all available over there. So if you want the details, go there. But I can give you a very brief summary of, I think, the, the big key points. So to go from sandbox to, to incubation, you need to have the stuff in production used by multiple companies. Uh, and so these are like real things that are being used in production. If you're not there, you're not in, in, in incubation yet. Um, you may not have, so Vites is a pretty good example. So Vites was something that was in use in YouTube for uh, five years running YouTube. I mean, that's like a real production use case. Obviously not scalable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not, not highly available, not scalable, but you know, it didn't actually meet our criteria for graduation because it had a you know, relatively small number of companies behind it at the time and you know, things have changed, uh, which as I've mentioned earlier, that's you know, not necessary. If, if Google decides that they don't want to run YouTube on Vitesse anymore and they you know, sunset it, we don't want to have told our members that they should bet their business on it. Um, so we needed to have multiple companies, you know, actively uh, working on the stuff into the future. Um, and the second thing is, you know, one or two or three production uses is different than 20. Um, and so many of our, you know, Kubernetes is in use by more than two or three or four. It's in use by thousands of companies. Um, so that's, you know, the, the sort of big steps between the two. And there's a lot more detail behind it, which you can look up. The key is to allow, you know, some minimum, obje uh, you know, objective requirement and then allow the subjectivity of the, the TOC based on their experience. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, what specific resource can a project get from CNCF? And is there a difference between the sandbox project and the incubator project? And, and the third question is, is there investment between CNCF and the projects? Okay, so first question was really around what do, what, essentially serve, what, what do projects get from CNCF in terms of services and what they could request and is there a difference between the services we offer at the different levels of things? Um, so we have kind of a centralized mechanism where projects could request services. It's, 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 it's on GitHub. If you go to github.com slash CNCF service desk, um, it's a variety of things. Uh, projects could request 
um, technical documentation help. We've done a lot of websites. We, for example, we just redid the website for Container D. Um, we spent a quarter million dollars in security audits for a lot of our projects. Um, we host events. Uh, basically, you could think like uh, technical documentation help, uh, security audits, event, like, hey, I want to host an event. Um, hey, I want to go speak at a conference. Can you pay for my travel? I'm a maintainer. Uh, they're all kind of listed uh, uh, on that repo I mentioned, but it's like events, marketing, um, uh, you know, travel services. It's, 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 it's quite a, a big list that, that we have. Um, uh, do we offer different levels of services for projects? Um, Generally, we haven't necessarily discriminated like, you know, if a uh, earlier stage projects wants like a security audit, like we're generally open to it. But we generally, you know, my, my opinion is if you're a uh, more established project graduated incubator, we will offer more services. We have very strict rules in terms of uh, marketing related services that we offer our projects. If you're an early stage like sandbox project, uh, we generally don't do any proactive marketing like we don't do press releases or huge promotion because you know they're still experimental right we're not we don't want to uh, essentially bet and, and push a project that may not be ready to um, a, a wider community so um, those were your two and then your third question was around in, investment like what, what what do you mean by like does cncf invest like what do you mean by invest in projects like yes, I mean, directly investment from cncf to the project no, no investment, right? Uh, like yes, dollar, dollar. <laughs> okay. Do you want to speak into the mic there, Chris? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, uh, we don't, like projects are independent communities. We don't, uh, we're, we're not for profit. We don't do like venture capital style investment in, in, pro in, in projects. Um, we have a philosophy that Dan briefly touched on this morning where uh, our goal is to cultivate, we call like three Ps, it's uh, CNCF's role is like we host projects, we have members that pay us fees that essentially they build products based on those projects which generate profits for these members that they reinvest back into the, the project. So that's kind of the role of, of, of CNCF, if that makes sense. But yeah, we're not for profit, we're, we're not a venture firm, we're not a VC firm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that the one caveat to that is there are certain cases where you know, if, if there are 10 small projects that, that all need, you know, documentation assistance, for example, then it makes sense. We'll just hire a documentation person and spread them across 10 projects and yeah. everybody's happy. But, yeah. but, you know, most of the time developers just want, like, help with, you know, hey, I want to travel to a conference because I got invited to speak there or I need doc help. Um, so it's, and we're happy to provide that type of assistance. Any other uh, questions for us? Otherwise, I'm happy, like we're all, you know, if you go to the CNCF TOC uh, GitHub repo, we're easy to contact, or you could just email us. So um, we have open meetings. Everyone's welcome to attend and, and uh, ask any questions there too. So if not, um, thank everyone for your time. And uh, it's good to have folks learn a little bit more how the sausage is made in, <laughs> in CNCF. So thank you.